Okay, hang on one second. Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to Trauma and Burn Orientation. Um, this is originally set up for critical care, but what we've done is we've expanded this, so now it kind of extends to not only critical care, but all of um, all of the units that take our trauma patients. So as Cindy said, we are recording this. Um, upon successful completion, it means you have to view this entire session and complete the online evaluation with attestation of completion. And Cindy will have that for you, like she said, in the chat function, or you can email her. Um, one hour trauma hour and 0.5 burn hours you get from doing this whole thing, and you will get one CNE. Uh, just so everybody's aware, neither Cindy or I have any conflict of interest um, as we do this presentation. Um, you're going to be hearing from me. Um, I'm Jennifer Fritzine. I'm the trauma program manager, trauma and burn program manager here at Children's. I've uh, been in my position for uh, almost 11 years now. Um, my bedside experience, um, most of my bedside experience has been with transport or in peace intensive care. Um, I also have bedside experience on an ABA burn unit um, as well as working here at Children's in the ER. Uh, Cindy is our other presenter. Um, most of you know her. She's our injury prevention education and outreach coordinator. Um, Cindy was a paramedic before she was a nurse, and as a paramedic, she was in transport and has also worked in the field. And as a nurse, uh, she was a picky bedside nurse until I stole her to come work for us in trauma. Um, here at Children's, we are an American College of Surgeons Level 1 Pediatric Trauma Center. And we are also a Maryland Verified Trauma and Burn Center. Um, with our trauma population, we see patients that are less than 15 years of age that come from the field. Meaning if you are zero through 14, 14 years and 364 days old, you will come to our trauma center if you, something happens in the EMS as to who's bringing you in. If you are under 18, you may transfer here from an adult facility. Um, so our 15, 16, and 17-year-olds you may see coming in as our trauma transfers or being transferred um, after being stabilized. You can see we have three levels of activation criteria. We bring kids in from the field or from transfer as a trauma staff, a trauma transfer, or a trauma staff attending. And you can see the majority of our kids are coming in from the field as a trauma staff. Um, and I'll explain that here in just a second. So our activation criteria, our trauma stat and trauma transfers, they both have the same criteria. The difference between a stat and a transfer, a transfer patient comes from another hospital, meaning they got in their car crash, they got hit by a car, they went to Sibley, they went to Holy Cross, they went to Inova, and were stabilized there. And then we've gotten a call that they want to transfer to our facility for definitive care or for a specialty consult. And so these kids are going to come in to our trauma bay as a transfer patient, just like they were coming in from the scene. Reason being is because a lot of these adult hospitals are not used to kids. And so in the trauma bay, we'll be looking for um, additional injuries that may be missed because of the pediatric anatomy being different from that of the adult. We also, when we bring them into the trauma bay, we have higher priority to CT scan, and we'll have our whole team there. So we can get in and out of the ER a whole lot quicker if we bring them in as a trauma versus if they just come in um, as a transfer patient to the emergency department. Now, our trauma stats, again, these are kids that are going to be coming from the field. And if we look at um, our criteria here, you can see on the, oh gosh, I have no idea if it's the right or left side. Um, you can see airway, breathing, circulation, disability, head of face, neck. So you can see there's a lot with physiology and anatomy. Um, for instance, if they have dyspnea in the set of blunt trauma, if you see early signs of shock, um, if they have a known SDH or EDH as they're transferring, if they have numbness or tingling in their extremity, those are anatomy, those are physiology that gives us the criteria that, yes, we need to see you in the trauma bay because your injuries are severe enough to activate the team. We also have mechanism criteria. So if your anatomy and physiology is okay, but you fell out of the second story window that's about you know, 15 to 20 feet in the air, um, just the energy that'll be pushed to your tissues based on that height of fall means that we're concerned for injury that you just may not be showing signs or symptoms of yet. And so we'll bring you through the trauma bay. And there's several of these mechanisms that we see. And to be honest, we see a lot of our trauma bay volume 
based on mechanism only, especially because car seats are so good. You know, you have those five, five point car seats that takes a PhD to be able to figure out. And so these little guys can be a restrained passenger going 60 miles an hour and not have any injuries. But because of the speed and uh, the potential, again, we'll still have them come in. Now, our trauma set attending, this is about 15% of our total population, so it's not high volume. But trauma set attendings, these are our sickest kids. These are our kids, all the criteria is physiology or anatomy. And you can see anybody that requires intubation by EMS or intubation on arrival. If you have a flailed chest, you have problems with breathing. Um, if you required CPR before you got to us, whether in the field or at the outside hospital. Um, if you needed blood any time before you got to us, GCS less than eight, you have a pulseless extremity, um, burn greater than 40%, exposed brain tissue, all those are going to need our highest level. When we have a trauma stat attending, the difference between our trauma stats, trauma transfers versus our trauma stat attending is who's going to come. To the trauma stat attending, we are going to add to our trauma team an, att uh, an attending surgeon. We're also gonna add a critical care fellow. Um, anesthesia will be there. Um, and I think those are our two big additions. And those additions really are because of the fact most of these kids are probably gonna go to the ICU and so critical care can help start managing from that point, from point of entry, and also help uh, facilitate a bed. Uh, our, our attending surgeon needs to get there because if we have decision for surgery, they need to be available um, immediately uh, to take these patients to the OR or to be able to um, open something up in the moment. So our top five mechanisms of why kids come to our trauma center here at Children's. Uh, first reason people come, most kids fall. Matter of fact, there's about 2.8 million kids are gonna fall each year. Um, and a lot of them are gonna fall from second story windows, third story windows. The good news is, is most of them don't fall from too far. Second top reason we see kids, motor vehicle crashes. Third, pedestrian stress, followed by kids getting hit while riding a bike. And then our fifth top mechanism is our abuse, physical abuse patients. Now, if we wanna look at severity of these top five mechanisms, we can look at the percentage of death for each. So our top injury, the top reason kids come in is they fall. Most kids do not die because they fall. Matter of fact, we all know kids kind of bounce. Um, most of these kids who fall out of a second story window end up going home. They may have a broken bone, um, you know, maybe a, abrasions, maybe a concussion, but most of them will go home. Out of all kids around, across the whole country who fall out of windows, only about 1% to 2% will have uh, fatal injuries or even devastating injuries. And most of those are associated with falls from really high up. If we look at percentage of death, here at uh, Children's in FY19, 28.6% of all of our kids in motor vehicle crashes died. 14.3% of our kids hit by cars died in FY19. We had no deaths by bicycle crash. That's not true in every year, but it happened to be true in FY19. And then in fiscal year 19, 28.6% of our physically abused children who came through the code bay died, which is really interesting that motor vehicles and NAPs were the exact same. And these numbers do change year to year, but not terribly. We want to look at where patients go from the emergency department. When they come in our trauma bay, the majority of all of our patients are going to be um, sent to surgical care unit for observation or uh, continued care. 21% will be discharged home. 10% will go to our peace ICU. 7.3% are gonna go to the OR. And 2.4% go someplace else. Now where could that someplace else be? We've had a couple kids go to our psych unit. Um, a couple kids, because of bed availability, might go to 7 East or uh, 4 Main. Now, what kids go to the PICU from the trauma bay? Most uh, of our head injuries are going to go to the PICU. If they have a small subdural, small epidural, neurosurgery may choose not to go directly to the OR, but they may watch these kids in the PICU overnight to make sure that that bleed doesn't expand. 
Of course, if we have a major head injury, those kids would all go to the peak ICU, whether it's uh, before surgery or after surgery. Our burns of greater than 15% will go to our PICU. And then, of course, any unstable trauma patient or any intubated trauma patient will go to our peak ICU. Now, each of our units that we transfer to, there's definitely goals. Um, the goal for the ER, obviously, is we do our primary and secondary assessment. We are going to do any emergent procedures that need to happen, uh, give prophylactic antibiotics that are time sensitive. And then some of our kids are going to stay in the ER for a few hours because we'll want to, want to observe how they're recovering. And in that observation period, we will decide are they stable enough to go home or do we need to admit them to the surgical care unit for further observation? Kids who go to our surgical care unit, these are kids, like I said, who need more observation or may need things like continued antibiotics, um, may need a lot of our broken bones who need to go to the OR and have, some, have a bone reset, so go pre-op, maybe come back post-op. Um, Kids are going to have issues with pain, but are going to be, these kids are going to be hemodynamically stable, um, breathing on their own, and all of them will have a GCS, most likely over 10 in order to go to surgical care, although that's not written in stone. It's just kind of one of those clinical decisions. Um, as far as our PICU goals, um, our goal is to get to the PICU. Um, the ER, when we have a kid in the trauma bay and we know we have a PICU admit, our goal is to be everything done in that trauma bay and CT scan into the PICU within 60 minutes. We know that the ER is nasty dirty. Um, I've spent a lot of time working in the ER and we do great work, but there's a lot of cooties that go through there and our unstable children are um, gonna be better served the faster we can get them out of that trauma bay and up to their PICU bed where definitive care can happen and people are specialized um, in that unstable ventilated patient. So what can you do? What is your job as the bedside nurse taking care of our trauma patients? The biggest thing that we look for uh, bedside nurses to do is assessment, assessment, and assessment, um, and reassessment. Um, a lot of these kids are not always obviously sick. They come in. Um, now, some of our patients come in, and they are broken and bruised and, and abrasions and lacerated all over and we know they're sick. It's obvious. Those are the easy kids to take care of because they're telling us what their injuries are. But a lot of our patients um, are going to have delayed injuries or post-resuscitative injuries that we need to look for. And it's all about our assessment um, by the nursing staff in their units that are going to really drive this. For instance, you can see on this picture the patient with the post hematoma. Um, this is a sign of a basilar skull fracture. And as we know, bruises a lot of times don't show up right away. It's in, you know, that 12 to 24-hour period after you're injured that the bruises start to happen. You can see on the upper right uh, a child with um, uh, bruising around his eyes, drawing a blank to what it's called. With a um, raccoon eye. Thank, raccoon eye. Thanks, another sign of a basal or skull fracture. And then the final patient on the bottom right is a seatbelt sign. These seatbelt signs, again, may not appear for, you know, 8 to 24 hours post-injury, but those seatbelt signs, that may be our only clue that this patient has some type of injury um, internally. And so watching for these bruisings, watching for where they're getting sore or tender, um, being able to get them up and ambulating, um, can they tolerate food, is really an important uh, issue in this uh, post-injury phase. Now, trauma patients are pretty special. They can bleed, they can get cold, and they can get acidotic. And these are the three things that we're most worried about. And when those three things happen, this is what's referred to in the trauma world as a trauma triad of death. Now, when we look at the trauma triad of death, it is our job to identify cold, acidotic, and hypovolemic and to jump in and do something about that because they all play on each other, and we can't fix one without fixing another. Now, if I look at this trauma triad of death, the most amicable, amicable one for nursing by ourselves with nobody else around to fix is hypothermia. So it is really important that we keep our trauma patients warm. And it's not about comfort. It's about stopping the bleed. Because if I can warm my patient up, I'm going to improve that coagulopathy. 
And then I'm going to improve that acidosis and improve my patient's metabolic ability to oxygenate their tissues. I had a nurse ask me one time, it was about 101 in the middle of July, and we had a trauma patient coming in, and they immediately took the bear hugger off the bed and didn't put blankets on. And my question was, why? And she said, well, it's really hot outside. Well, when you're losing blood, you're also losing heat. And it doesn't matter that it's 101 um, degrees outside. It is really all about stopping the bleed. And hypothermia um, is not going to be your friend in that trauma triad of death. So first of all, keep our patients warm, and that's going to help stop that bleed. Now, when we really look at that triad, if I have an acidotic patient, they are not going to do well. You're going to have poor perfusion to the tissues if you're acidotic. You're, our patients are going to be anemic, which is one of the reasons that they're acidotic is because they're losing volume. They have vasoconstriction um, as part of the fight flight. Uh, and again, that hypothermia and blood loss all play into this decreased cardiac output. So it's going to be important to uh, reverse this acidosis. Now, we're not going to reverse this acidosis by giving bicarb. We're going to reverse this acidosis by acknowledging the blood loss and replacing blood loss and by keeping those patients warm. Our patients also now are coagulopathic as part of that triad. Um, a lot of that is just because they've been bleeding out, and when we start to resuscitate, uh, we start by giving red cells. Well, now we're diluting out the, the platelets and the fibrinogen that they have. So we have to keep, keep an eye on our PT, PTT, and even maybe a TED, depending on how sick these patients are. Now, when we look at acidosis, coagulopathy, and hypothermia together, again, this is all part of that hemorrhagic shock um, that we have to look at. Um, and again, hypothermia is probably the one that we can start with um, as then we proceed to giving blood. Now, the other thing with this, as we're giving blood or fluid to these trauma patients, it's important to give them to warm up anything that we're giving them because we don't want to cause them to get colder as we infuse. So keep them warm. That's going to help stop the bleed. The goal is not to use normal saline. We would really like with our trauma patients to replace what they've lost. And what they're losing is blood, both red cells and yellow. And so be mindful of too many crystalloid fluid boluses. And one normal saline bolus might be okay, but if we're looking like we need a second, that's when we need to start talking about blood products because that's what's going to help maximize our oxygen to our tissues as well as reverse the coagulopathy. And now I'm going to turn it over to Cindy. Hey, guys. Everybody can see my screen, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Jen, if you can see it, that means everybody else can yeah. see it. Okay. Yes. Um, so if – and. Um, and feel free to um, use the chat function um, to ask any questions during this. Um, Jen's going to be monitoring it so she can um, stop me and we can um, interact if you if needed. So Stop the Bleed is a program by the national, um, the, oh, the uh, ACS, so the American College of Surgeons, um, the Hartford Consensus, the military and the Association of um, Emergency Medical Technicians. And it's a nationwide effort to um, educate the public on that if you bleed too much, you die, and to keep the blood inside the body. Um, basically, it's just the three ways to um, stop the bleed, and we hold this class here at Children's once a month. Um, however, right now we are not teaching it, but I'm, we're hoping that as soon as all of the restrictions have been lifted, we will continue. Um, and you can register for it at this link below. Um, one second, I'm having a feedback issue with my sound. Okay, so all trauma and burn education can be registered through this website. It's just trauma and burn, trauma burn education dot ticket leap dot com. Um, so. One of the things that you are now working in, so you are in a level one trauma hospital, and we have all different types of physicians in our hospital. So when you're in the PICU, you're used to working with attendings and fellows and residents, and the same, we have the same setup with our surgical team 
um, here at Children's. So we have our attending physicians. So these are our, hold on one second, lost my mouse. So our attending surgeons are the ones on the tops with the picture. So Dr. Bird, he's our trauma and burn medical director. And then we have all of our other attending surgeons. Now, um, in the PICU, our fellows are there for three years at a time. In pediatric surgery, we have our fellows for every two years. Um, but we have our residents every like one to three months. The average is about two months. The thing to remember here is if you are taking care of a patient and interacting with a resident and you don't get the answer that you feel that you need, just remember that these guys have only been here for one to three months. So don't be afraid to escalate and go up the chain. Go to the fellow, go to the attending, go to your fellow, go to your attending if you don't feel like you're getting the answer that you need. Um, we also have our trauma and burn uh, nurse practitioners. They're here Monday through Friday. This is a number that you want to write down, 202-476. Um, uh, I can't see it because my screen is a little messed up. Jen, what's the number? 8212. 8212, great. So these are our nurse practitioners, and they're here Monday through Friday. And once... Um, we have passed like the restrictions. They are also here on Saturdays. They're a great resource. And again, they're nurse practitioners. So all of them were in your, um, in your position at one point or another. So I feel like they have a, like a better view than pretty much than um, most. And they are great at advocating for you and for your patients. Other resources that you have in the hospital. So you have Jen, who you met earlier. You have me, and you have Liz Weibel. Um, Liz Weibel does all of our um, performance improvement stuff, and you guys already know what Jen and I do. Um, Dr. Dean is a critical care liaison to our trauma service, and then we also have our um, OTs and our PTs. Now, I know that in the PICU, you don't interact with them all that often, but in surgical care, they are the ones that are getting these kids ready to go home. Um, most often, they start their um, assessments when, you're, when the patient is in the PICU, and um, even though we don't interact with them all that much in the PICU, they are um, a, a wealth of information, and if you're having trouble not knowing like how to position or how to reposition your patient, they're great. Um, they're great people to reach out to. We also work with our dietitians. Um, one of the things that you will see in the PICU and in surgical care and anywhere in this hospital, if you work here for more than five minutes is um, child abuse. Now child abuse in the PICU and in surgical care and everywhere else is co-managed. So it's co-managed to make sure that all the labs and imaging are complete Labs that you will see drawn um, if there is suspected child abuse, the CBC, amylase, lipase, um, liver function test, UA, tox screens, and then we have the injury dependent labs. Um, so that's like vitamin D, any of the labs for OI, and OI is osteogenesis and perfecta. And that's important to make sure that um, we draw all of these labs to make sure that there's no medical reason of why something like why a child has bruising or why a child has broken bones because wouldn't it be terrible if we're like okay this is definitely child abuse and they had osteogenesis imperfecta and that's why all of their bones were broken um so definitely um we make sure that we cover all of our tracks for this one thing to remember about drawing any labs is if you suspect non-accidental trauma or child abuse in your patient these labs need to be drawn pre-transfusion because once a patient has had a blood transfusion, these labs are, the, the it, they really can't be counted. Um, all of our imaging is injury dependent. So we do gentle imaging here. We don't just like, if you come in and you were hit by a car, we don't scan you from head to toe. Um, with child abuse or in, in suspected child abuse, we um, open up our like index of suspicion a little bit more. So we'll do an abdominal CT if the ALT and the AST are elevated. We do skeletal surveys um, on, and when I say skeletal survey, that is a X-ray of every single bone in the body. So if there is suspected abuse, we will do a skeletal survey for all of our kids. Um, the head CTs, if the child is under one or if a child of any age has 
unaltered mental status. And um, sometimes we go further and do MRIs of the brain and the spine. Um, and the consults that you will get is our Child and Adolescent Protection Center. So we have physicians that work in our hospital that are specifically trained to diagnose and rule out non-accidental trauma and child abuse. Um, if you do have a patient in any of your units that you suspect that there is something that story doesn't match the injury, you can ask for a CAPSI consult. Um, and CAPSI just stands for Child and Adolescent Protection Center. Also, um, people that you want to get involved with are social workers and trauma needs to be consulted. Again, like non-accidental trauma, you need to have a trauma consult as well. Jen, is there anything that um, you think needs to be added about child abuse that I haven't covered? Nope. Okay. So now that we've gone through like all of the different places um, our trauma patients can go in the different units, I think it's important to remember that and you can see on this slide here that most of our kids end up going home, like over 95% of our kids go home. You know, some go to rehab, some go to the morgue, some go to an acute care hospital, some go to foster care, and some go to psych, but most of our kids end up doing okay. Kids are resilient and with the right care and the right assessment and all of the, like the right specialties, most of our kids go home, which I think this is the good news. Um, and then for our burn population, I'm going to hand this back over to Jen. Okay. Whoa. Hang on. Sorry about that. It didn't. It stopped where you left off. While Jen's going through that, does anybody have okay. any questions? No, thank you, Cindy. Okay, thanks. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about burns. Uh, we have about 2,000 visits, burn visits a year. Now, that's not individual patients. That's how many times patients, you know, may come back. So a lot of our burn patients may require one clinic visit or one ER visit, but there are, a lot, there are other kids out there that we may see six, seven, eight times per year. The average number of visits each burn patient has is between two and three visits. Um, so that number, if we looked at actual patients, is probably more like 1,300 in, uh, unique patients. Out of that, we, uh, our admission rates have rarely went down over the years, as with uh, burn centers across the country. In uh, fiscal year 19, we had 82 burn admissions, um, which was actually a little bit up from the year before. And the reason is, is we are now starting to treat more burn injuries as outpatients versus inpatients. And we're able to do that actually pretty successfully. We, oh, if we look at uh, the pie chart right here, the green really is all the number of patients that we see um, in our clinic. Our 82 burn admissions last year, 17 went to the peak ICU. Of that 17, six were on a ventilator. Uh, we had 21 kids out of that 82 that required uh, NG feeds. 21% of them were greater than 10%. 50, 50 of those kids were, um, had burns less than 10%. And four of our 82 patients had inhalation injuries plus or minus a burn. Now, kids who are burned go to our ICU if their uh, total burn uh, equals uh, greater than 15% or they have an inhalation injury, and of course, if they are unstable. Now, when we look at NG feeds, we've gotten kind of particular about who we feed. It is really important for a burn patient to increase the caloric intake by about six times what their normal calorie intake is, and that is to promote healing of that wound. The more calories, the more protein that a burn patient gets, the better their wound is going to heal. And we've learned over the years that young children who have big burns don't eat. It just goes with the territory. And if you've ever tried to bribe a three-year-old to eat, you know that it's virtually impossible. So the rule we have is if you are less than five years old and you have a burn that's 10% or greater, you automatically get an NG within the first 24 hours that you're admitted, and we will start at NG feeds. And you have to prove to us that you can eat enough calories before we will stop those NG feeds. Now, we say we'll do it within the first 24 hours because a lot of these patients with these bigger burns, 
For their burn debridement, we'll take them to the operating room um, so they can have a pain-free burn debridement and dressing change. And we'll go ahead and put the NG in while they're in the OR so um, they don't have the trauma of dropping an NG. Now, some other things to remember for our sicker patients. If we have an inhalation injury, we may use the Sino kit. So that Sino kit, um, I know there's two in the ER. I'm not sure, uh, Teresa, you may know if there's one stocked in the Pixis in the ICU. If not, this is something you can quickly get from the pharmacy. I know for a fact that we keep at least eight of them in the hospital at all times. Now, Sino kit is basically it's a B vitamin, and what it does is it binds to the cyanide that will be in the body. When you're um, in an enclosed space and there's a fire, there's going to be uh, carbon monoxide or cyanide that you're going to inhale. Those patients will inhale that, and that cyanide binds to their uh, hemoglobin, and it takes the, the place of oxygen. So if we have cyanide bound to your hemoglobin, the oxygen has no place to go. So now I have a kid who is oxygen deficient. So it's important that we get that cyanide out of the body. So this cyanide kit, it comes in five gram uh, vials. And the pediatric dose is 70 uh, milligrams per kilo. And you can give that twice. So we can re get the initial dose and we can repeat it one more time. Um, we will get the cyanide, cyanide kit based on two things. The first is, are they showing signs and symptoms of uh, oxygen deprivation? Now, the one thing that you're not going to see with, this, with somebody who, is, uh, who has cyanide in their system is their pulse ox is going to be normal. Pulse ox is normal because what it measures is hemoglobin saturation. Your hemoglobin is saturated. It's just not saturated with oxygen. So we're going to have to look at assessment to, you know, are they blue around the lips? Are they having increased work of breathing? What kind of signs and symptoms are they giving you that um, may show that they have an issue? What we have up on the screen right now is in our trauma manual. It's uh, just a, a good reference about uh, when to give uh, the Sino kit and what kind of things can happen because of it. Um, and I think what's really nice here is it shows you, scroll up a little bit, Cindy, it shows you that if you have 15 to 20 percent uh, carb, uh, carbon monoxide in your body, then you're going to have headaches and confusion. That's the, the lack of oxygen going to your brain. 20 to 40 percent, you're going to have just dis, uh, disorientation, visual disturbances. Once you get, you know, 40 to 60 percent saturated with carbon monoxide, now you're going to be combated and eventually become obtunded. So you can kind of see it's not just all about, you know, do I have blue lips, but how else am I acting? that can give us uh, ways to know that uh, we're oxygen deprived because of an inhalation injury. Now, just a couple other things to know about a patient who has gotten uh, the Sinokit. It turns their urine really red. And so we don't need to put a Foley in, we know it's gonna be red. <laughs> and when you see the red urine and you know they've gotten the Sinokit, they are not bleeding. Um, you can dip it if it makes you feel better. It's in the UA if it makes you feel better. But it's just the fact that it turns your urine red, and we know that. Um, the other thing it can do is uh, cause you to have a little bit of a high blood pressure or in a headache. Uh, it doesn't happen to everybody. It doesn't happen often, but just so people can be aware of that. Biggest thing for cyanide is just make sure that when the ER gives that, it's important um, that that's included in the report. Um, and it should be in their system uh, probably about less than, less than 24 hours for that urine oil, oil turn back to um, regular. And why, Cindy? Funny, oh, here we go. I was going to say, funny things are happening to my computer. Yeah. Um, I can't. It's not letting me, oh, here we go. It wasn't letting me advance. Um, now, the other thing to remember is we have a big burn that comes to our piece ICU is once they hit the ICU, we're going to start the fluid worksheet for any patient that has more than 15% burned. For those of you in the emergency department, you should never see this fluid worksheet. The emergency department is going to give volume to these patients, but they're going to give LR, and they're going to give it at one and a half times maintenance. 
Once they get up to the ICU, we will do, we will get them weighed, we will get an exact TBSA, and that's when we will start the fluid worksheet. Our burn, uh, burn leadership, Dr. Bird is our medical director. Um, and we recently uh, developed a relationship with the hospital center across the street. And Dr. Laura Johnson and Dr. Jeff Shep are the uh, burn surgeons over at Washington Hospital Center that now have privileges here at Children's. And they are now on our call schedule helping Dr. Bird uh, manage the care of our burn patients. So they've really been a wonderful asset to our team. Um, and helping us really push our abilities to take care of these kids well. Now, if I have a burn patient and we have problems, if they're in the ICU, obviously you want to uh, go up your critical care chain of command, your resident, your fellow, then your attending. But we also want to make sure that as you're going up your chain of command with critical care is that the surger surgery team knows what's going on. Uh, you know, the first line of escalation, if our surgical residents aren't giving you what you need, our NPs are fabulous. They know burns inside and out. They live burns every day, and they, they actually autonomously run most of our burn clinics. So they're a great resource, can help get you what you need uh, from a burn aspect or from a fluid management standpoint. Our surgery fellows can be a great assistance. If you guys aren't feeling you get what you need, of course you can always escalate to Dr. Bird, Dr. Johnson, or Dr. Shep, who's ever on. I do have nurses telling me a lot of times that they're not really comfortable calling Dr. Bird at home, and that's fine. I, I have no problem calling him at 2 in the morning. So if you want to call Cindy Liz or I because yes. you don't want to bother Dr. Bird or Dr. Shuck, give us a call, and we will not blink an eye in helping get what you need. You should never be taking care of these patients and stressing because you're not getting what you need. There are plenty of people here to help you. Um, those of you in the ER, when you have a burn, bad burn, 15% or greater, there are goals in the ER. Obviously, airway, breathing, and circulation, always our main goals of the ER. Let's stabilize those things and get them transferred. Um, when, when they're in the emergency department, again, we're going to run fluid at one and a half times maintenance. We ask that the emergency department does not put the Foley in. There is literature out there to show that Foley's placed in emergency rooms have a higher incidence of CAUTI than if they're placed in the ICU. And so we would like to wait to place that Foley till they get to the ICU. Um, as far as NG placement, if you need to decompress that belly, go ahead and place the NG. Um, if it's not for belly, you know, if you don't need to decompress, we can wait and we can um, put that NG down when we do the dressing change and we give them some of the good drugs. Um, the ER, when they transfer the patient to the PICU, they're just going to cover the burns with the sheet. We're not going to do the dressing change downstairs in the emergency department. We want to do it in the PICU, ICU, where we can give a lot of good drugs and we're in a much cleaner environment. So the emergency department is going to cover that patient with a clean sheet. doesn't have to be sterile, just a sheet. Now, that does put a little angst when they get up to the PICU because a uh, PICU nurse is going to go ahead and take that sheet off. And sometimes that sheet is going to stick to that burn. And when you pull it off, you're going to be pulling some skin off. It sounds unpleasant. It's, it, it's not wonderful. There's nothing fun about being burned, but it, it is somewhat expected. And that's really doing a natural debridement, and it's what we're going to be doing to that patient anyway. Um, and they will have pain meds on board. So um, it's not near as awful as what's happening in your head right now as I'm telling you about it. Our goal with these burn patients who are 15% or more is to get them to the PEDS ICU within an hour of them walking in our door, faster if we can. When these patients get up to our ICU, um, we need to make sure we have either a surgery resident or a practitioner at the bedside, so um, as, as well as your critical care um, physician. And our priority of care in the PICU, just like the ER, of course we're going to pay attention to airway breathing and circulation first then we're gonna to wanna to make sure that they are adequately managed with their pain. Once that happens, um, and this is probably gonna not only be pain medicine, but some good sedation, we're going to go ahead and debride those burns. We need to get them well debrided so we can assess the depth and, the and get a full TBSA of that burn. Once that is done, the surgery resident or NP who does that uh, procedure will let you know the TBSA, and at that point, we can calculate the fluid needs using the worksheet. And that worksheet, where it looks a little complex, if you just follow it, 
it actually um, makes a lot of sense and it will be a great tool to help you with fluid management. We'll get fluid started using the fluid worksheet. We'll get the Foley place. They'll dress the burns while you're doing that. Um, get our NG plays, start feeds as soon as they're hemodynamically stable. And then it's time to look for more um, long-term access, like a CBL or an art line, if need be. Now, both the emergency department and PICU have burn carts. And it's important that you guys know where your burn cart is. Um, in the ER, they also have burn supplies in the trauma bay, so there's a couple places they can get that. And those of you in the ICU, um, as part of a, a hunt, and maybe Teresa can help us with this um, after the lecture, she can show you where the burn card is and then where the fluid worksheet is within that burn card. Now, another place we might do burn debridement, especially that first burn debridement, um, the kids could come into the emergency department with their burn. If we can give them sedation and make it um, viable to do, we will go ahead and do their burn dressing downstairs. However, if we have kids that are more than 5% burned, they're really anxious, or they have, we just can't control their pain, these are kids that may be admitted overnight for burn OR14. So OR14 is something we've worked out with anesthesia, so we can get these kids um, into the OR for uh, general anesthesia and a preem-free burn first bird debridement and dressing change. So these kids with these small, smallish burns or these kids who just are really anxious or having pain issues, they'll get admitted, um, they'll be NPO and admission, and they will be the 730 case um, that is usually done by one of our nurse practitioners and discharged home from there. Um, we have availability in OR14 on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Um, if we have somebody that meets OR14 criteria on a Thursday or a weekend, um, they will be admitted, but they won't be a 730 case. We have to do them as an add-on, so it could be later in the day. And at that, Cindy, I'm going to let you take over. You're muted. Thanks. Um, okay, so I will start over again. So we have a set of videos on <clears throat> on YouTube that go over every single aspect of burn care. Um, we start out with prevention of like how not to get burned. However, then we go through all of the steps of what happens after you do sustain a burn. So if you can look. Everybody, I'm assuming, can see my screen. You can see that there is a host of videos like all the, on here, and we have 15 of them going from the beginning all the way to the end. So we have the ER, we have just understanding a bird injury, information about skin grafts and um, laser treatments, and the differences between the units. So we have like a video just on surgical care, we have a video just on the PICU, um, and we did this, and these are, um, can be helpful for nursing, but they're made for families to explain all of the different steps and what to expect. Um, we found that a lot of um, parents, especially if they have a child in the PICU, don't understand the differences between the PICU and surgical care. So they're used to like this very like intense, I'm your nurse, I only have you as my patient, possibly another patient, then going to surgical care where you don't see your nurse as often as you would in the PICU. So, this goes through visitation um, questions, social work questions, everything that you could imagine about like the differences between the units are on here. Um, also explaining about our burn clinic and like how to get there and what they do, PT and OT, nutrition, and um, also um, our relationship with the DC Firefighter Foundation. And they're the ones that paid for these videos to be done. Um, after, I'm going to give you a preview of one of them. It is four minutes long, so I'm only going to play you about the first two minutes of it so we don't waste time and there's room time for questions. But all of these are able to be accessed on the GetWell Network, and I'm going to show you how to order videos in the GetWell Network after this. But I'm going to share this so you can just watch a couple minutes of, and this just explains the whole team. I don't know what 
Okay. So um, I, I, I think there is something going on with the sound, but that just kind of gives you an overview of what that looks like. Um, and now... Okay, so in order to get these on the Get Well Network, so first you can just go to YouTube, and I put the link in the chat function, so it's bit.ly forward slash after the burn. And, then, or, and how to order them on the Get Well Network. We're not Sorry. seeing your screen. We're not seeing your screen. Oh, that's so strange. Hold on one second. There we go. Okay, here we go. All right, so in order to um, order these on the Get Well Network, you just have your um, just Cerner pulled up, and on, you go to your left sidebar and you click on Add Orders. So, well, we got just got to find orders and then click on Add. Now, normally um, in the in surgical care and in the pediatric ICU and in the PACU, as nurses, we're not putting in orders. This is the one time where we can put in orders. So you just have to, um, you go and you click on orders, and then you'll have this screen pulled up. Once you get to here, you'll click on add, and then you'll type in GWN, that stands for Get Well Network, dash burn, and then all of the videos that you saw on YouTube will pull up. And you can just pick the ones that you want um, the patient to watch, and then they will automatically pop up on the screen in the, at the patient's bedside. Again, this only works if they have the Get Well Network on the TV. So if you are um, in a pod where there are three or four beds, they won't be able to get these because those TVs don't have Get Well Network. So again, these are like the single rooms with a TV with the Get Well Network that this will work for. Once you um, choose the videos that you want, the screen will pop up. So you can see that I chose for this patient understanding a burn injury, a stay in the PICU, and a stay in surgical care. That way my um, patient and their families could see the difference between the two. And on the bottom right, you would click sign. So down here, there's a little button that says sign. And then they will pop up as that they are processing. Now, the one thing we have to, we have to make sure that we get from processing to orders is just press the refresh button. Just as we do in everything, if like something hasn't gone through, we press refresh and it pops through. So you just hit refresh and they go from processing to ordered. Um, so this is the end of the lecture. So we're gonna open this up for um, any questions. So feel free to, you can say this out loud or you can use the chat function. And Jen and I will both answer. Do you guys have any questions? No? Okay. Cindy, thank you so much. I know we're, uh, we're going to see you again in like 20 minutes for uh, speed callers. So we're looking forward to that. Um, but if they don't have any questions right now, if they think of anything um, about the data, I'll send you an email. Oh, that's great. Um, Melissa, Laura, um, Wendy, anybody um, else online? If, if you want, you can unmute yourself and ask any questions or use the chat function. Nothing. I have any questions, but I think maybe look. Oh. I think we had some other ER folks on um, our line, which was like Winston and Joe Nick. Some of my ER nurses. Oh, there's Joni right there. Never mind. Cindy, I have a quick question. Sure. Um, I know we were giving cards for, um, like the burn cards for parents to access things on YouTube. Where can we get those cards? So currently we're out of them and okay. we are ordering more. Okay. And um, if you will, if you will send me and a follow up email, so I make sure that I can just, I will bring, um, I will bring you some personally, and then we can talk about where to put them that so everybody can get them um, in an easier fashion in the future. Thank you. And for everybody on the line, um, what she was talking about is we created a little business card. It's um, with all of the information about the videos that we could give to parents.
It has the link on there, and it also has a QR code that they can just scan with their phone, and all the videos will pop up on their cell phone as well. As, so this works great. If we have families who do, are, do not have access to the Get Well Network, they can just view them on their phone. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and end this, and thank you all for joining. And again, if you go to the chat function, the evaluation link is in there.